What's up, everybody? Let's see who we got here. Mastercraft. Taego. Jackson, what's up? Kamar. Stedman, I see you. Linry. Larry, okay, Larry, I got you. Oscar, what's up, man? All is well. These are, um, these are the, uh, Power Wow Nickel that I'm playing on. It's, uh, this set right here. It looks like this. That's what's on my base. That's normally what I'm playing. I actually, uh, I actually need to change these strings, but yeah, they're the, uh, they're the, uh, the power wound nickels that I normally play, but they're, even with the life kind of gone on them, they still sound great. Y'all like saying that, that, man, that still sounds a little crisp. I, I have this bass preamp on that's boosting it just a little bit, but this is just with the string. So I'm still getting a lot of, um, a lot of tone out of these strings, even though they're about dead. For my for my taste. So I'm still getting a good little tone out of them. So the life on the strings is pretty decent. And you know I play a lot. So yeah, for them to be lasting this long, it's pretty cool. And I normally get a, a good lifespan. Like I, I drive my strings. <laughs> like I drive them. So the wheels run off of them before I change them. So, well, I, it, it didn't get all bad. I, let me change it. I used to do that. I used to keep the strings on a, for a long time, but now I change them pretty often. So I probably change my strings probably eh, once a month, maybe, depending on how I'm playing. If my hands are real oily and all that kind of stuff and the strings have no life to them, um, yeah, I might change them a little sooner. But I think about once a month. Sometimes I can go longer than that if I'm switching out bases. But if I'm playing a one bass kind of consistently, uh, depending on the kind of sound I'm getting out of it, I, I kind of can go once a month. I don't like, <clears throat> I generally don't like changing too often uh, because I like to keep a consistent sound. You know, I like to get the strings broken in a little bit. That's me. I kind of like right out of the box that really crisp sound. I kind of like it sometimes. Then at other times I kind of don't. I don't like too much of the brightness when I'm recording. But when I'm playing live, I kind of like it. Like it's a it's a love hate thing with me when it comes to my strings. So I'm you know I'll just kind of change them at will. Like right now I feel like I'm close to a string change. I need to do a string change soon, very very soon. And I got strings. I just you know I just kind of I'm I'm weird. <laughs> I'm weird. So yeah, this uh backing track by the way, if you guys haven't heard it yet. Uh, I posted this on last week. I got another one that will be coming up this week. Maybe two. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see how it rides. Uh, do you connect your bass direct to the sound card or through another device? I failed to get a clear sound. I'm actually running through my uh, rig, my bass rig right now. Um, it's my TC Electronic bass rig. If you're talking about recording, I normally go through some type of uh, preamp uh, before I go in. That's generally how I, I go in through some type of preamp. I've talked about this before on the other lives where I use, I'm using right now the Spectra Drive by TC Electronic. It's a bass pre that I'm using. And uh, yeah, it, it has a pretty clean tone to it. I would love to do chops on this track. Yeah, it's already on YouTube. Yeah, it's been on there for about a week now. I, it, it went up actually June 12th, so about four days. I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah, it's called That E-Funk. Uh, if you go to my page, you can find it. It's available right now. Uh, yeah, I put that up a few days ago. And as a matter of fact, I think I did a lesson uh, this weekend as well. If you guys haven't checked out that lesson, I think it's called add add that sauce to your plan or something like that and i used this backing track as well in that lesson so yeah it's definitely there on youtube so by all means check it out 
funky track. We're just going from the one to the four. Uh, and we, you know, we do the James Brown hit on the five. You know, back to the one. Cool. so you can play around with different ideas see what kind of context you can add so if you hadn't already commented let me know where you're watching from be sure to drop that on the chat as well go ahead and give this video a thumbs up that definitely helps this video to be found by more people like you and I appreciate you guys rocking with me today um so yeah I see you man watching from Greenville South Carolina I done passed through that a good little bit <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so I wanted to uh, jump on here, man, and just kind of share some things I've been working through this morning. I've been, you know, up this morning kind of practicing. Where do you get those tracks? I create them. I create the tracks. Yeah, so all of those tracks are original. Um, all of the backing tracks that you hear that I post, I, I create the tracks. So, um, oh, yeah, that's a great question, too, because I guess some people think I, I'm just randomly uploading. Now, I, I personally create the tracks. Most of the time, I'm playing all the instruments on the tracks. So when you hear all of that stuff, all of the guitar, all, all of the drums or whatever, that's that's me. Uh, no problem, Oscar. So yeah, some, some of the things I, I wanted to kind of share with you guys that I was working through was really just trying to be a little bit more clean with the stuff that I'm doing. Not necessarily learning a new catalog of licks and you know all of that kind of stuff but more so taking the things that i already have and cleaning them up a bit and if i you know kind of incorporate some new stuff in there that's cool as well but just you know just taking simple stuff that i'm already doing and trying to be a little bit more clean trying to be a little bit more intentional about what i'm playing and how it is i'm playing what i'm playing so with that of course i'm working out with speed you know, and that kind of stuff, uh, working out with slowing down <laughs> to make sure that everything I'm playing is precise, you know. Like, oh, we would have take that key of uh, E. So if I were to take that. You know what I'm saying? It's a minor pentatonic with that... Uh, we can add that major third in there too. That major. 
major third, but it's other than that, it's a minor pentatonic. And I'm starting here on the five. So I'll take something that simple, and it's the same thing, but I'm just starting four or five. down from there take a line that simple and just really work on cleaning it up and playing it a little faster to add in the grooves of that same thing down an octave scale is good to play on the funky uh, yeah so i'm telling you right now this is um, a minor pentatonic that i'm i'm playing i mean there are tons that you can pull from but i mean a good starting place would definitely be the minor pentatonic uh, just using that straight minor pentatonic one two three four five then we start over you know all of that's minor pentatonic that's generally where most people start with these kind of grooves. Now there I'm playing G major. Or you can take G major pentatonic and what I'm doing there is like taking that relative, relative major. that over you know over that E minor pentatonic which actually works out to be one of those five shapes of the uh, minor pentatonic which is a that's a whole lesson in, in itself but yeah so that relative relative major and using a minor pentatonic so we that's two things you can kind of do uh, just over uh, like a funky groove no problem uh, statement says in theoretical sort of sense when you move from the one to the four, where can you go musically? Um, I was just playing kind of over that, the chromatic move. So I'm, I'm taking just, when I was just moving, kind of use that minor like an easy way of thinking of it and I don't want to dumb it down but just for people that might be beginners that are watching this or you know, beginner to intermediate you're trying to just find something to add over that you can take just using that four you can still use the E minor pentatonic even over the four so I'm just going to the four just just keeping things simple that same minor pentatonic and that's the thing about it guys and when i was talking about some of the stuff that i'm working on a lot of times you can take simple con concepts it's not always complicated stuff you can take something that's very simple and apply it over multiple places we don't have to come up and reinvent the wheel and you know if you want to get very very expressive of course you can get more technical where you're playing a <laughs> like all that kind of stuff you know if we wanted to do all that or figuring out other way you know just different kind of course that we can use and move around but if you just want to take a simple approach and just kind of find more stuff to add to the groove we can just take you know a simple take that just that uh, E minor 9 finding different ways to voice it so all of this is over the 4 
that particular regard, it's almost like kind of like taking that um, plan the uh, Locrian like there over that uh, over that C sharp. Yeah, so yeah, it's like that C sharp shape. All over that four, so I'll play it in context. So you see I'm kind of <laughs> struggling with this little arpeggio thing. I guess it's too early. So like that's basically what I'm using kind of using that locker in uh situation. Hope I'm saying that right. I don't want my, my theory here is to come kill me in the comment section, but it's all good. But that's the shape that I'm, uh, if I'm calling it wrong, you can charge it to me later. Uh, <laughs> I'll go back and research after this video. But I'm almost sure that's what we're using is that uh, C sharp like locrian over that four. <laughs> So that shape, a uh, shape again is and then you can walk it all the way down to the four. You see what I'm saying? What's up, man? Rinses. See what I'm doing? So I'll do that again. <laughs> All good, Oscar. So hopefully you guys got your bass out and you're actually trying this. Again, that's that C sharp shape. Uh, it's like a, a Locrian type vibe. Whole steps. So one, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, one, three, four, and then whole step, whole step, whole step. I'll do that again. One, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, one, three, four, whole step, whole step, whole step. We will land you on that dominant, that A dominant. You see what I'm saying? Okay. It's another way of playing it. playing all the notes again same notes uh, you decide to use it's totally up to you uh, so I'm gonna show you how I'm using that over that four several ways you can do it uh, 
do that kind of fast but it's that same idea that I told you and be sure to share this with somebody uh, y'all can click that share button because I get asked so many times like different stuff like that well how do you use the modes uh, it's like almost every live I do people will want to know about using the modes and this is a prime example we're kind of using this locrian mode over the four all right and so this is just one way we can kind of incorporate it all right so it's, it's like more so that c sharp locrian and you can do this in any key and we're using like so in in relation to uh, the key, we're in the key of E, all right? Just so we have proper context. It's in the key of like an E minor funk group. So we know in the, the C sharp would be the six, all right? That's your main sounds like a D major starting on the seven. Well, yeah, the, so it's like exactly what it is. Uh, obviously with the Locrian, that's what we're talking about. So, because normally you would... That's a different way of looking at it. You know, you can look at it as just regular D major, but starting on the seventh degree. But of course, that's you know, the same idea as the Locrian scale. So taking that mode, and, and thanks, Chris, for pointing that out because for some people, this might be like a foreign language. But it, it, I like to simplify when I'm thinking. And I didn't really get on here to talk about modes, but we're here now. But you know, when I'm thinking of modes, I like to simplified and make it make sense to to me i can't say the average person it has to make sense to me for me to properly use it in context but it's yeah it's the, that very thing chris you can think of it as a whole step down d major all right we're in the key of e you know so if we're in that d major all right and so if i play that i'm sorry we're in that e e like e dominant or minor however you want to look at it and I go a whole step down to that D major if I take that one degree down starting on the seven I'm still hearing that E over it because the problem if I start thinking about it in D major that takes to me that takes my mind to D major and I don't want to think from D major I want to think from just perspective of this E. So if I start like a, uh, with that seventh degree or start thinking of it as that uh, C sharp locker in, you know what I'm saying? I still have that E kind of pedaling up under it. A more, uh, I don't even know how to describe the sound. You see what I'm saying? So again, I'll put it, I'll put it in context again. Here we go. taking that same pattern you know taking that same pattern throughout you can do that that note doesn't really 
really go, but... working on even though we got off on the modes is just trying to even clean that up you know what I'm saying it's the same pattern but just changing the phrasing of that particular pattern kind of gives you some variation you can literally sit there and play the same thing over and over again with a different variation and it feels it feels different let's see if we can try that uh, context <laughs> different stuff kind of having a little a little bit more of a bebop phrasing throughout you know some of them were kind of straight some of them had that bebop type thing uh, uh let's see here i like using a sort of permutation but utilizing the fretboard uh, uh <laughs> instead of throwing out them big words <laughs> all right so uh let me read here oscar says uh uh, Jay, I don't know music theory, but I do have photographic memory. And because of your finger position on the fretboard, for me, it's very easy to see the scale of pegios. You're playing good. No problem. No problem. So, And that's the thing, y'all. If anybody knows me, uh, you've been here long enough. You know I don't profess to be a theory major. I do um, understand what I understand. I have taken music theory. I'm not an idiot either when it comes to music theory. So... <laughs> There's a fine line. I don't, I put it like this. I'm not the very technical type when I play. I don't think about all of these, you know, some people are like that. You're re re very analytical when you look at this stuff and figuring it out. And that's great. I just don't approach the bass like that or any instrument for that matter. I just play what I hear. I play what I feel. And if it sounds good, I go with it. And so, but if you need the theoretical side of it to help you better understand, that's totally cool. But if you're someone who's watching this video and you're like, man, I don't know what all that stuff means, use your ears. At the end of the day, trust your ears. Thumper, what's up? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, trust your ears when it, when it comes down to it. Like, use your ears. Because when you get in a live music setting or if you're playing with a group of people, a group of other phenomenal musicians, trust me, most of them... There, from my experience, I can't say this across the board for everybody, but from my experience in most professional settings, we're not sitting there talking theory. We're playing music. We're not talking music. We're playing it. And if somebody plays something, I have a response to what they played. Or if they play a line and I catch that line with them, they don't sit and stop and break down the theory of what that line is. It's like I hear it and I do it. Or I hear it enough times and I try to repeat it or I try to respond based on what I felt according to what they played. And now I might not know any theory. I might not know what any of this stuff is called. But based on what I felt from what they played or what I heard, I respond. And so having a vocabulary and listening to music, the biggest thing about it, listening to the music. And if you're a person that's visual and you catch shapes, that's cool too. But whatever your tool is. The biggest thing and the most important thing to me is being able to express it musically, not talking about it, but being able to musically express it. Because I know people who could talk theory under the table, but when it comes time to plug up and actually play the music, no context. Like, you know what everything is, you know what it all looks like, you know what it all sounds like, but when it comes to putting it in the groove, like the biggest thing that I'm showing you guys, I'm saying this is a Locrian. I'm almost positive this is a Locrian that I'm playing, but I could be wrong, theoretically. But when it comes to me playing that groove, I know exactly where it goes, and I know how to put it in proper context. You know what I'm saying? So 
that's the biggest thing because I can sit here and call all the right names and name out all the different skills, but I put that groove on and I can't play none of it. Y'all like, mm, sounds good, what you saying, but when you plug up and when you start playing, it's like, eh, I don't get it. It's not connecting the dots. But if I can connect the dots with what I'm playing, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that kind of... <laughs> Chris said, the toolbox doesn't make a good plumber. Listen, listen, that's some good stuff. <laughs> All right, so, um, Andre, good morning to you, man. I seen you. Uh, let's see here. I missed some other comments. Whole theory, but you're a whole theory genius, bro. For real, for real. My whole playing style has been fun. Wow, man, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I got a long way to go. And, and that's, that's the fun part. <laughs> the encouraging and discouraging part about music is you never know it all. You never know it all. It's like, I don't care how long you've been doing this. And as long as music has been around, it's so much we don't know. Because even when we think we might have mastered um, the genre of music we do, there's like a ton of other genres out there. Or it's steadily upgrading. Somebody can be in the same genre of music you're doing and they're upgrading that genre. And there's so much other stuff that's added. So you're constantly learning. So you're, you're never a master of this thing. I mean, you, some degree of it, it's like you can master some degrees. But all of that's relative. Everything is relative when it comes to playing music. I think we're forever students. And I, I don't call myself a master at all. I, I know there's a lot of things I've learned. There's a lot of things I put a lot of time in. And I know what to do in certain situations. And I, I can trust myself and I can trust my musical um, knowledge to be able to know, OK, I can put this in this groove. That feels good. That doesn't feel good. You know, so we don't take that away. We, we know what we know. But at the same time, we're forever students learning this thing. So I welcome you, you guys' feedback as much as I'm giving stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can pull some of that stuff off in a quartet, but you just got to be slick with how you do it. And I, I come to find that out because, you know, I, I produce some quartet records and stuff. And every now and again, I'm able to slip some stuff in there under the radar. It's just how you do it and how you get away. Now, if you playing a full solo. OK, yeah, you definitely going to stick out like a sore thumb. But if you know. about it we sit here and we work out the timing of okay how would I do that how would the timing of it fall and that's something you don't want to be trying on a gig you want to like spend some time <laughs> he said yeah I need that in my email uh, I gotta work on that one Obviously, there are some grace notes and some stuff that's kind of going with it. But there's so much stuff that we can kind of work with. Uh, that's another one. kind of get away with it the stuff that I'm doing it works over the one and the four so this it still works over the one as well and, and uh, yeah so you can the thing is trial and error seeing what works see what feels good see what sounds good to the group that kind of thing all right <clears throat> So and that's why I love playing. There's always more. Absolutely. There's always more to it. All right. So that is a very humble approach to music theory. 
Listen, I, again, there's so many people I know that can just, that know music theory and play it and apply it, you know, that could run circles around me as, as it relates to just knowing all the theoretical options that's available for this particular context. So never get too proud. Never act like you know more than what you know, because there's always somebody out there that, that can humble you down. So I think humbleness is the way to go. <laughs> it's the way to go because you just never know. You just never know. Hum and the, the, it's funny because humility and confidence, like you gotta, you gotta make sure that you don't mix up the two. And like, there's nothing wrong with being confident in what you do and what you spent the time practicing and being able to learn. So like when I pick up and I have to play a song or play a recording or something like that. I know what I'm bringing to the table. I know what I have the ability to deliver. And so I'm not going to uh, act like I'm shy in that. I used to do that. And I call that false humility. When you act like you're shy and like you can't do anything and like, I don't know this. And I, like, that's a, a sense of false humility. Humility is like, you know what it is that you're able to do, but at the same time, you don't walk around with an arrogance because of it. Confident, being confident in what you can do. Hey, I know I can play this song. I know I can play this song really well, but I don't come in here with a pompous attitude as if I'm the best ever to ever sit down with a bass in my hand and play this because nah, at any moment, a little six-year-old kid can come in here and chop you up. So you can, you can humble yourself or be humble, that kind of thing. So humility doesn't always mean you're shy or you're super passive and i think for years we've confused humility with with other things and called things uh humility that's not necessarily humility and uh if you're if you spent time and you've worked on your craft and you've really put the time in practicing you know the material be confident actually enjoy yourself don't be sitting there timid and calling it humble no you're just timid you're just shy and i know about this all too well you know what I'm saying? So don't don't confuse the two. Being humble and, you know, not being overly uh, arrogant or overly proud, whatever the case might be. You know, that's a different different thing from, you know, humility, shy or humility and proud. Or comp no, I can't say proud. Humility and arrogance. You know, they you, you gotta you just gotta be careful about it. Make sure you define define it the right way. That's the best way I can try to say it. Just try to make sure you define it the right way. And there's some people who can use a dose of humility because you know they too confident, they too cocky because you know they know their stuff and there's nothing wrong with that. I know my stuff and I come in here and I do my thing. But you gotta make sure that your confidence is not coming across as arrogance and sometimes I've heard people say uh, people who are not sure about themselves call confidence arrogance and yeah I, I've seen it both ways because obviously if you're insecure that's a be better word people who are insecure oftentimes can call confidence arrogance because somebody seems so sure about what they're doing and you've been so used to like downplaying yourself or being insecure about what it is you do now you see somebody who is solid at what they do and they know it and they come in and do a good job they might not have a pompous attitude but because you're insecure you perceive that as cocky or arrogant so you it's it's a fine line it's a fine line and so i think doing a little more self it always comes back down to self doing more self-evaluation to kind of see where you're at on the spectrum to see, am I really being humble or am I being insecure? Or am I, you know, just kind of calling something something else uh, because I hope people perceive me as humble. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm actually insecure. All right, so good morning to my Nigeria people that are watching. What's going on? Yeah, so Oscar said, uh, you can tell Jermaine is feeling the drums on the back of, in the back of his head. Absolutely, yeah. I'm always I'm always hearing the drums. That's something I always pull from is that that drum that drum thing that rhythmic uh, feel because that's always setting the stage uh, for what it is I'm trying to do. So I had a question the other day 
while I'm here, I had a question the other day in one of my lessons, and a guy was asking him about ghost notes because I know some of you guys, uh, you know, you want to know how to incorporate the ghost notes uh, more. So one of the things I told this particular student in one of my coaching calls, some of you guys know I do the one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. They're included in the packages of my lessons, my monthly membership exclusive lessons. You can get a one-on-one -on -one coaching call once a month with me as well. Um, so in this particular lesson, I was just kind of telling him how it, how I use the ghost notes and how I began to start incorporating the ghost notes. And one of the things I did was just pay attention to like the hi-hat pattern. You know, pay attention to like the feel of the song. I'm always listening to what this song is doing or the hi-hat or the shaker or something that's giving off that feel that's subdividing. So if I got this, you heard me doing it. So like, of course that's real loose, but what I'm doing, the groove is... Try to play a watered down version of the groove. So if that's the simple groove and I want to add some ghost notes in there or I want to make it a little bit more rhythmic so I can double up on it. And I'm doubling up and I'm playing 16th notes. So notice with my left hand, that all stays the same. Like the groove in my left hand stays the same. It's still this. All that stays the same. You know what I'm saying? And I just start playing 16th notes in my right hand. take a little time like I was saying today some of the things I'm practicing on is working on just cleaning up simple stuff like that like slow that down you know and so on and so I'm just keeping a consistent thing going. And once you get that, get it on in your hands, get it pretty even, now you can start taking away notes. Now we don't have to sit there the whole time. Because after a while, your hands will get tired after doing that for so long. You can, you can develop endurance, but if you sit there and do that a whole song, you're going to get tired. I don't care who you are. You're going to get a little tired. You might can pull it off, but you're still going to get, your hands are going to get tired from doing that, especially if they just keep that groove. Wow. Once you start moving around though, <laughs> it gets a little more complicated. And that's a good way to, to even work on just speed and getting clarity with speed is taking that little chromatic exercise. find you have a little bit more trouble in the lower strings because normally depending on your right hand technique and I don't really get into all of that but it depending on your right hand technique sometimes we're kind of floating on the, the next string at least I do float on the next string down and so that can sometimes Kind of affect you moving your hand around uh so yeah uh let me see here i use them to count time and or space specifically when i'm slapping got you yeah like just 
subdividing all together, it's like if you want to know the count, we count that generally one e and uh two e and uh three e and uh four e and uh and that's that's kind of how it's counted out in music so like one e and uh two e and uh three e and uh four e and uh so each one of those uh notes have uh syllables rather have a name so one e and uh two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e so that's how we normally count it and so on so if there's anybody on here that already knows all this excuse me I'm explaining it to the people who didn't get all of that musical knowledge or anything like that no formal uh, schooling or anything like that. So that's that's how generally how we count it and subdivide it. And again, like I said, once you get that under your hands, now you know how to take away how to take away certain notes. Maybe I don't want to do that on every one. same pattern I can do it on the string above so I'm, I'm dividing those strings up now and with my left hand I'm just going to string above and I'm doing more of a ghost note I'm not playing the actual note more of a ghost note it's like a hint of that note that's there so yeah so those are some different things I'm kind of working through again at the end of the day not necessarily learning that but for me personally trying to clean it trying to clean as much as I can you know <laughs> summer cleaning normally we do spring cleaning but I'm, I'm doing some summer cleaning or i'm having to clean up my plan because after a while you can get to the point you get so comfortable and you know you start falling off in areas because there are seasons that i go through where my clarity is very very everything is very clean and precise then there are other seasons it's like eh, <laughs> it can use a little work and you kind of play the idea is still there but just being clean with the idea sometimes it doesn't come across as clean as you would like for it to and so that, that's some some things that I, I kind of work through from time to time when I notice that it's bothering me about my playing like uh okay that wasn't as clean as I would have liked for it to be another thing about that is making sure you're satisfied with your own tone and your own sound don't play the um the comparison game when it comes to tone um, because everybody's tone is not the same. Uh, yeah, Victor Wooten's uh, bass lesson video, yeah, that's a great one. I actually was watching that a few weeks ago. The one he did with, uh, what was it, Hudson Music. But yeah, every everybody's um, tone is not the same. And don't worry if your tone is not everybody's favorite. You know what I'm saying? That's one of the things I've, I've been kind of really paying attention to. I, when I hear bass players that all have the same tone, they all have the same voices. Like, man, I, I need that. You know, the, the, all the highs got to be up. They got to have that smiley face type thing. Or all of them have to sound like Jocko. It's like, nah, what's, what's your sound? And be comfortable and confident with your sound and work. At the same time you're working on being clean, like work on, because I'm doing it. I'm not telling you anything that I'm not doing myself. I'm constantly working on what's the better sound for this particular thing that I'm doing. Like, does this work? Like, all right, what am I not hearing? What do I want to hear more of? All right, so for me, that, that can get a little muddy from time to time. So, all right, so if I'm getting in that lower register, I'm playing more solo type stuff. I might not be cool with that so I might want to roll off some stuff 
And I just, you know, go through trial and error until I find something that I'm, I'm really happy with. Normally, I can find a tone that I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with. But as I'm practicing, I'll experiment with certain things that I'm playing because, you know, everything don't work for everything, for lack of better words. And so once I'm playing these different tones or not tones, but I'm playing these different feels and stuff, I like to see what they feel like with a completely different tone to it, my hand position and that kind of thing. Like that particular tone there, I don't like in this position, this hand position, so I might have to change. I don't like that, so how do I adjust that? What do I, what do I adjust to fix that? Until I find something that I'm happy with. Let's try it again. And literally, that's like my practice. I will sit there and play the same line over and over again and just adjust tones. And and like, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't like that, you know. Like, and I also, ask, I'll talk to myself. I also ask myself why I don't like it. Okay, what about this? Don't I like? All right, it's. Like, uh, maybe it's too, maybe it's too muddy. I do like a lot of mid range depending on what it is I'm playing, but I like clarity as well. But I don't like overbearing clarity when I'm using a lot of mid range, meaning like it sounds pecky. I, I, I can't even think of a better word for it, but. <laughs> getting closer to something that I can I can deal with but I, I just keep going back and forth and you know so to me that has a lot more clarity to it but it is like right on it crisp of being uh, too pecky for me yeah, my pots need clean. And then a lot of that, when I can't find the tone that I'm looking for, a lot of that might come down to the fact that my strings, uh, that sometimes is the indicator to me when I when I know my normal tones that I can find, I'm not finding them. It's an indicator to me, okay, maybe you need to change your strings. So that's something that I take into consideration as well. If I'm, I'm, I keep dialing in and I'm like, all right, normally that's the sweet spot and that ain't the sweet spot for some reason and I keep... You know, you, you kind of know after you've been playing a while, you kind of know what that sweet spot is that you like to play. And if you keep doing it, keep dialing in, like, come on, something is off. 
you might need to change your strings. And your strings might be decent, but you're still not finding that sweet spot. Change them good old strings and then, <laughs> then go to it. And it's like, oh, it opens up a whole nother world of like tones when you change those strings, especially if you've been rocking them for a little while. So yeah, that's, that's kind of like my process. Like I tell you, I'll sometimes just kind of go through and, you know, I know a lot of bass players or musicians in general that do that, that keep playing the same thing over and adjust, play the same thing, adjust, play the same thing, because at that point, I'm not working on a lick, I'm listening for something specific. So as well as working on cleanliness and all of that and cleaning it up and being precise, I'm listening for my tone. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm getting the right tone. And granted, a lot of the tone is coming out of my hands, but it's my hands coupled with these electronics. Because if I pick up a different bass and start playing the same thing, I'm gonna have to do you know some of the same thing. Uh, yeah, these are Bartolini's, Bartolini pickups here. <laughs> Your victor so <laughs> uh yeah i'm not gonna butcher that but find those harmonics all over this to that song is being able to kind of let the harmonics ring out while you're playing it which I'm absolutely not doing right now uh, being able to let those uh, ring out Cheapen the the uh, the perfection of that song. It's a lot of genius that went into creating that, and it's a lot of fine detail that if you don't play that fine detail right, it doesn't go over the same way. And Victor has a touch when he plays that uh, tune. Obviously, if you don't know, that's Victor Wooten's uh, version of Amazing Grace. He has a special touch when he plays that. I haven't. Heard, I've heard many people copy. I ain't gonna say many people. I heard people copy that. But nobody plays it like him because he has a special touch that he does when he plays that song. So yeah, that that ain't even considered a tribute at that point because this don't even <laughs> scratch the surface to how good that was. Uh, yeah, Amazing Grace when Victor Wooten was the song he played changed my absolutely, absolutely. David G, what's up, man? Russia in the house. I have 
one song that I did on my uh, my record. Uh, it's actually in um, it's in F sharp, but it, it uses those harmonics uh, uh, called "You Have a Friend." bass that I played that on was tuned down to F sharp so I was able to pull those harmonics off there so actually an F sharp my bass is just tuned uh different today I know y'all didn't ask me that but yeah this is a little shameless plug of a song <laughs> Yoel Joel what's up man appreciate it uh nickel strings nickel strings uh I got MK1 it's my uh, Lakeland okay MK1s okay you said you got MK1s in your Lakeland Yep. So, all right, guys, that's pretty much it for me today. 
thank you, Oscar. I appreciate it. And uh, some other cool stuff that y'all need to check out on that record as well. Uh, I played a few of the songs as covers on my channel, but uh, be sure to pick up that record. Jermaine Morgan Band, Dreams Work Reality. All right. Are there any good songs from tunes that your children might watch? Um, I, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. I mean, that, I, you caught me off guard with that one. I, so I, I haven't, my kids don't do a lot of TV. They uh, do, you know, little stuff here and there. We, we limit their TV time. So, so yeah, they don't do a lot of TV. Uh, I'm trying to, I can't think of, like, literally, I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. But I'll pay attention to some of the stuff that they watch. Uh, I know they watch this little show, Androids, or something like that. They like, they really like that. But only thing, they have uh, the weird science thing that comes on at the end. Uh, That they are the, the, the song. You know, something like that. But I, I don't know really of too many shows that they watch that have cool bass lines. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Oh, you're talking about the MK1s, JD. Um, greetings, what bass amp are you using? I'm using this uh, TC Electronic uh, RH750, and I, I got two, four 12s, and I've been using this for years. It, it, at the time that I got it, it was I really liked the sound of um, the TC Electronic rigs. I had been introduced to TC probably, man, it had to be 10 years ago at least a friend of mine was playing them uh david haynes finger drums he was playing those rigs for his finger drums and it, the sound was so clear i'm like for he literally had a drum pad and he was running his drums through that rig he used that as his bass rig and it was so clear with an actual bass rig and he was running his drums through it and you could hear everything crystal clear and, uh, and a few times I plugged up my bass. I think at that time I was using the 450 and he had the RS2, he had the RS210, four of them. So I was using that rig and I was like, man, this is like crystal clear. I can hear everything. And, uh, you know, just kind of got introduced to TC Electronic through that. And later, Sean Michael Ray brought the TC Electronic rig similar to what I bought, he brought it to my house, the RH750, and he literally plugged up his whole rig. I think he had a 210 and a 212. And uh, I played through his rig and I was like, I was sold. I was like, wow, this is like really amazing. At the time I was using a different brand and uh, I was looking you know, to switch to do something different. And like I said, Sean Michael Ray, another basis, he was on my channel. Uh, a few years ago on Jermaine Morgan TV, but he brought that rig over to my house in my environment and I was able to try it out and really just kind of see the versatility of it, see the different presets and all that kind of stuff. And I was sold on it. And this was like probably, man, this was, had to be eight years ago, um, seven, maybe seven years ago. I don't know. At this point, it's Time is kind of getting lost. But yeah, since then, I've been using the TC Electronic stuff. And I've been had that, that particular setup, I've been had for at least, because where I'm using all 412s, I've been had that setup at least four years, four to five years. Because I was using two 10s and the, the K212, one K212, but now I got four K212s. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, not four, two k two twelve. so it means four 12-inch speakers all together. And I'm using an RH750 amp uh, from TC Electronics. So that's just what I'm using now. I'm uh, I'm, I'm sure it's some more stuff that's been came out since then that sounds amazing. I just haven't uh, spent much time with trying to pursue another rig at the moment. 
It's just what I'm using now. It still works. <laughs> it still sounds good. So yeah, so hopefully you got the what, when, where, why, all that kind of stuff. That's how it came about that I'm using that particular rig. As you guys can see, if you've been following me for a while, I'm pretty consistent with what I use. This is coming up on 10 years that I've been using uh, my signature Warrior Isabella base. Uh, you can, yeah, you can store your setting on three memories. Yeah, you can store your settings, yeah, with that particular amp. You got three different options to store. Are there any songs that might keep up with Hercules? David, I'm not sure what you're talking about, brother. Uh, <laughs> uh, greetings, what bass amp are you? Okay, I answered that. All right, I think I've hit everything, hit everybody's, uh, hit everybody's questions. Yeah, David G, I'm I'm not I'm not sure um, what you mean with the questions that you're asking with the songs. So yeah, I'm about to jump off, guys. Thank you again so much for being here this morning. Got other stuff I got to do today, and uh, yeah, if you haven't checked out the latest, um, if you if you haven't checked out the latest videos that I've uploaded on last week, do me a favor and check those out. Um, Great, thanks, Mr. J. No problem. Is that 35 scale? I think so. Michael, I think that is a 35 inch scale. Yeah, I see you, Disney's Hercules. I I I don't I wouldn't know. Uh I I wouldn't know. <laughs> so yeah, this is um it's uh she got some war wounds, like I said. I have it, I've had this base for about 10 years now. You can see it, you can see the nice lines curves and everything in it I'm trying to hold it in an angle where you could kind of see it well this is the body alder body i think it's a flame maple uh flame spalted maple top and um custom knobs that go with it now i will tell you the story about these war wounds that's on there i didn't put all these war wounds on this base i had it damaged like this big nick here and i think one yeah like two of them at the bottom it came from being damaged like three months after i had it uh the airlines damaged it i think it was american airlines i watched them throw my base it like that was like the last time i i let anybody put my base on the plane so now it's super lightweight it's super lightweight like literally super lightweight base lightweight uh, yeah this Bartolini pickups that's in this base it's a custom preamp uh, from warrior JD this is a warrior base by the way you can see the uh, three-piece neck it's a uh, maple and um, purple heart pretty standard with the warriors and uh, bird's eye maple fretboard ebony inlays Yep, so it gets a little get a little darker tone out of it when I go to my mid-range. And so yeah, that's the headstock of it. So if you've been following me, you know I've been rocking this bass for a while. Most of you guys know me for this bass. And so yeah, that's that's how those nicks happen. The airline literally grabbed my bass to put it on the plane and they just it was in a case. It was in a nice case. And some kind of way my base got damaged. And something told me we were going to Virginia. And I saw them like throw my base. And as soon as I got, as soon as we landed, something told me, check your base. Just something ain't right. You need to check your base. And sure enough, I checked it. I looked at it. It had, oh, I'm sorry. It was this chip. I think one at the bottom. And this big nick right here. I was like, I was hot. I'm talking about I was hot as fish cheese. Y'all ain't never seen me mad. That day I was mad. <laughs> it's like, I need answers. I need y'all to do something. Uh, the airlines did do something in terms of uh, trying to compensate me for my damages and that kind of thing. But yeah, that's, that's something that, that did happen um, to this base. And yeah, yeah. Fortunately, she still plays good, but those are some some war wounds that I had to endure. Like, and 
this was still a newborn and it got damaged so nonetheless one of a kind and uh nobody else has this one this particular base so i'm it's got pretty you know sentimental value a lot of sentimental value for me with this particular this base so if you're interested in it we're still <clears throat> with warrior still hopefully working on coming up with a signature line but in the meantime if you want if you want this particular base just request it go to warrior um you can hit them up on social media or whatever ask them for the jermaine morgan you know signature isabella if you're interested in this base or a base like this and they can build you one it's that simple all right so let's see here I've been practicing with that bass groove you put out and I love it. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate that. Uh, throwing my <laughs> throwing my bass will get you hurt. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they damaged my buddy Rodney Jones and that completely broke his man. That's see, that's that's whack. That's whack. But uh I think they did pass a law a few years ago that you're able to take your bass or your instrument on the plane as long as it can fit in a cargo bin. And I generally do that. Most of the time, they try to get me to check my bass. And I was like, eh, nah. I, I flew out a few weeks ago, and I had my guitar. And they was trying to get me to check it. I was like, nah. Well, they're going to charge you more for it at the gate. I'm like, nah, we're good. <laughs> they keep trying to get you. As soon as you get to the airport, they're trying to get you to check your stuff. And you just you just kind of go on past that. What I normally do is my little secret. What I normally do when I get, get to the uh, plane, I either ask for the closet um, or I just go ahead and tuck it in the cargo bin because I'm almost positive every time it's going to fit. Even on the little crop duster planes, it still fits in the overhead compartment. I mean, there there was one plane, I will say this, and when I flew to Texas, we my uh I flew from Shreveport, so that was a smaller plane when I got to Shreveport. Uh, I flew into Shreveport, I'm sorry. It was a smaller plane and I had to strap it in the seat next to me luckily there was a small flight and i could actually use that seat so i had to strap it in the seat because that overhead compartment was small but even on those planes sometimes you're able to use the closet so yeah don't be too quick to let people when you if you've never flown before don't be too quick to check your instrument if it's not in a hard case if it's in a hard case that's cool i have heard uh one of my homies was telling me <laughs> that he bubble wraps his instrument if you have to check it that's another way of getting around it you can bubble wrap it in your case and then you know you're kind of protected so that's another way you can go if you if you don't feel like you're going to be able to take it on a plane just bubble wrap it in your actual case it's a lot of work but at least you're not having to buy a base you know it's a little extra work when you get to where you're going but at least you're not paying for another instrument so yeah going through the headache of not having your instrument when you get to where you're going uh i've only got one bass and i'm getting another should i get a five string that's totally up to you uh it's totally up to you what you feel like you're comfortable with if you want to try out a five string by all means go for it i'm interested but it's hard to import to south africa oh, okay um they might be able to do something um I would check. I would still ask. Ask the question and see what's available before you just rule it all the way out. I would lose my religion if they throw my face and call the cops. Uh, your gig bag preference. For years, I've been using iGig, but recently, over the last three years, I switched to Reunion Blues. And so I use this, this case. iGig, don't get me wrong, I, I have no problem with iGig cases anymore. It's just they're super expensive for me they're, they're super super expensive um i like them because of all of the co compartment space and several other factors about them but at the end of the day my base when it got damaged it was in an eye gig case it did get damaged in an eye gig case like i said i love the compartment space and they some cool people they got the support you know the little support thing just like this case there's a little support thing that supports the neck when it's in there but um this this case i like it it's lightweight straight to the point you got a little little cargo space in here uh reunion blues like i said is who i'm pretty much with now uh 
Yeah, slick, sleek case, straight to the point. Put my base in there, my base is protected. Uh, like if I were to put it in here right now, you know, slide it in there and support it. Got the light, nice neck support right there that grabs it. You know, nice looking color, that blue looks good. And I've had this case for a while. Other thing I didn't like about my, uh, giving you the pros and cons, iGig makes super dope cases, but one of the cons I didn't like about it is that the case has the tendency to bend over time. And it can also be bulky. It has the uh, tendency to be bulky. And you don't find them, they're not easily accessible. You got to go to the website to get them. Um, and like, like I say, they, they can be a little expensive. I don't, I haven't checked with them in a while, so I don't even know, you know, if they've been even updating their stuff like that. Um, but most of my cases are I gig cases, but I do like now I'm pretty much been using, this is my newest thing, Reunion Blues that I've been using. So pretty lightweight, nice case. But I have heard some complaints about them as well. I haven't yet had any complaints. Um, but I will, you know me, I'm going to keep it 100. Um, some people I have heard complain that they've had the strap to break. I've never experienced that. I've had this case for about um, three years now. And I haven't experienced that. But another friend of mine says he's had the strap to break. That's the problem that he's had. I don't know if it was poorly put together or what, whatever the case may be. So it might be something you want to consider and watch out for and just kind of do some reviews on it for yourself. But like I said, this is currently what I use. I didn't have that problem uh, with a strap or anything like that out of my eye gig cases. This is just a little slight bending issue and that's more cosmetic. It wasn't anything that affected the guitar. It was just, you know, a cosmetic thing that I didn't like and have a little warped type look to it. This case is it still seems to be intact, still seems to be pretty solid for the most part. It still kind of looks new, even though I've had it for about three years. It still has its new look to it. And of course, I'm not hard on my stuff either. That has a lot to do with it. I'm not rough with my gear. I tend to try to take care of my gear as best as I can. And so obviously that has a lot to do. I don't throw my case around and all that kind of stuff. If you're reckless and you're hard on gear, I mean, obviously your stuff is not going to last long, but if you're kind of careful about how you use your stuff, about how you pack your cables, all that kind of stuff, then the lifespan on your stuff, um, it's going to last, it's going to last a little longer. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm using. So hopefully that's helpful to you guys. And again, I mentioned earlier, I do use SIT strings and I've been using SIT strings for about uh, 10, 11 years now. And they're cool. They, they get the job done that I need to get done. And they've been a cool company to work with thus far. So yeah, that's, that's the stuff that I use. Different strokes for different folks. If you find something that works, stick with it. <laughs> that's the best I can tell you. So again, thank you for, um, tuning in today guys you found this video helpful please like it hit the like button share it with somebody music for jesus thank you jermaine log off and go spend time with your family peace and blessings will do thank y'all uh i'm out peace